Hey, this is John Reed. Welcome to my 2022 on-site, on-the-ground, underground uh, SAP Sapphire Orlando podcast 2022. Uh, those longtime listeners know that this is a tradition that goes back many years now. And in Orlando, Dick Hirsch and I would grab an abandoned conference room and hope not to get kicked out and try to give you all our reactions of everything we saw on the show floor. Well... Uh, Dick Hirsch wasn't here this year, uh, but I did manage to pull off another special guest, Josh Greenbaum, which you're about to hear. However, I was not on my game with technology, so I had some technical problems, which is why I'm doing this brief introduction now. Uh, so just, just to kind of give you a sense of it, uh, I taped the 30-minute conversation with Josh, then he had to go, um, and then I'm going to patch in a short conversation I had with uh ASUC CEO Jeff Scott on the show floor, uh, so that'll come after Josh. And um, I'm going to summarize a few things on the Josh podcast because what happened was both my main and my back backup recording failed. Really awesome. But anyhow, the you can tell I have not been <laughs> going to as many shows lately. The backup one actually came out pretty good after the first couple minutes. So I just want to summarize just a few things. We started off in the part that came out crap, we talked about, first of all, I paid tribute to Dick Hirsch, uh, shoes that no one can fill, but that it's great to have Josh here. <laughs> and uh, I pointed out that uh, Josh was having passionate conversations with everyone on the ground, including the hotel manager. Uh, so I asked him what his goals were for the show, and he said he came here dreading a train wreck, but he didn't see how they could pull off a show that was a third of the size and had some restrictions on how people could attend. But he said he was pleasantly surprised, and that's where we're going to pick up this live recording already in progress. It really fit in and fit in very well. Um, so it was nice. It was nice to be back and, and get a sense of SAP and, and Sapphire and, and have it be a very positive experience overall. Yeah, I, I, I found it a little bit interesting just because leading up to it, I heard a lot of, uh, I guess, complaints from partners who weren't able to attend (laughs) who were in my inbox not happy about that uh this was an intentionally uh scaled down affair in some ways but i think the people that were here uh definitely were here to get something done uh this year we had a news guy josh so you and i can't possibly get the news on this podcast because the thing is like a book it was a book and um yeah, news news with uh, some of it had definite quotation marks around it. Uh, but you know, I, I honestly, the, the sort of the, the the breaking news idea is not kind of what I was here for anyway. So I think that's it's fair to say that yeah, there's a lot of announcements, but to me, I was really looking for stuff that maybe wasn't in a press release. Uh, are you surprised? No. <laughs> well, I mean, I think a lot of times. The most interesting stories are flying under the radar a little bit, anyhow. Yeah. So, what what were the things that you were chasing this week? Well, I, w- I was definitely chasing business network story, which actually did sort of surface finally in a rather coherent way for the first time. Truly, it's been referenced in numerous keynotes over the last few years, but I think finally we saw some real action um, in the form of Atasha Thurman, who is the chief. I'm going to get this wrong. Marketing Solutions Officer. Oh, yes, officer. he has one of those complicated yeah. SAP titles, CMSO or something. CMSO, right, right. It, it sounds like something you put on a joint when, you know, <laughs> it's overly inflamed. But, no, I'm, she was she was literally a breath of fresh air. Um, her partner in crime, um, Mohammed Alam, who is uh, the actually in, in charge of the whole intelligence spend group under Thomas Aurisig, was here as well. I know Thomas from... His, uh, I'm sorry, you know, um, Hamid from when he was at Microsoft. Paige Cox was here also. She actually is the sort of the guru of the business network itself. So I got to interact with all three of them, and I came away feeling like this is a really strong team, and um, they're getting ready to try to execute on a rather complicated and, um, and you know, and uh, how should we say, a truly game-changing initiative. Wow, game, use the word game changing. I might have to charge you for that. Oh, dang! Uh, but so sorry. but let me ask you. Let me ask I'm you though. Uh. Let, let me ask you though. What 
what was kind of bugging you about the business network messaging before this event and what, what kind of changed for you as far as where you said this, this might actually be a shift? Well, I, th- I think first of all, it was, it was really sort of dropped in. I mean, like the initial rise announcement. And you can, you know, check the box business network. There wasn't really a description of what it was, what the value was. Is this a SKU? Because a lot of the other boxes you could check were SKUs, were products. Mm. This was this was just a thing, a business network. I mean, they've had the asset network, they've had the logistics network. Obviously, they've had the Ariba network, our favorite. Um, that was said with a little sarcasm, but um, there wasn't really a lot to you know to sort of sink your teeth into in terms of. What is, you know, what is this, what's in it for me, the, the line of business manager, what's in it for me, the, the CFO, what's in it for me, all these, you know, et cetera, um, different, different stakeholders. And I think they really came out and kind of put a stake in the ground. I'm using all these metaphors waiting to get dinged again. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I think, I think there's some really good stuff. They, you know, the Taulia acquisition, uh, was closed recently and, you know, the, the, what Taulia can do for, uh, the whole finance side, uh, trade finance, spend management, um, that's pretty powerful. Uh, if you can get into a network as a small, medium sized supplier and have that network, you know, kind of help you out with the, the, you know, the vagaries of, of finance, that's, that's a positive. That's a good reason to be there. And you need good reasons to be in these networks. Right. So, so what do you think is the compelling reason now for, for a customer? Aside, you know, obviously some are kind of compelled to be on the network because their supplier requires it, but what do you think is the compelling proposition that's moving forward for SAP? How can they make a difference? Well, you know, and there's, there's of course a lot, there's many compelling messages. Right. That you need a lot of different personas, I right. realize, but, exactly. but what's working? Well, what's starting to work is that there's a story that's emerging about why would a small, medium-sized supplier want to be there. And that's the real trick to me. Uh, back in the dot-com era, error, um, there was this thing called Covicent. It's actually still around, lingering somewhere. But Covicent was, a, was the original business network. It was the automotive OEMs. They came together and built this trade network, and it became obvious that the small and medium-sized suppliers, if they were to dare join this network, they were just it was just a squeeze job. And they, they fled. They wouldn't touch it. And it sort of died on the vine pretty quickly as a result. This is the real holy grail of business networks is to not just say you can join our network for free, you know, bonus. Uh, you can join it because you're going to get more potential deals. You actually have to have more to it than even that. It has to be something people want to be part of because it has intrinsic value. And um, like I said, the trade finance thing is, it can be very, very compelling. Um, Paige was quite eloquent last time I met with her talking about the complexities of compliance and certification uh, for things like ESG, um, obviously, you know, uh, ethical supply chains. And these compliance requirements are very onerous. They can take months. They can take a huge amount of human capital to, to, to deal with. And if you can proverbially do it once, and then have that broadcast to an entire network of tens of thousands of potential partners. That's it. That's that's worth something. So I think that that messaging is starting to come together in a very neat way. Yes, and and for those of you that want to pick up on a little bit of this, if you didn't catch what I felt was a highly overly scripted keynote, uh, you can watch that on replay. And Atasha, uh, I think, was one of the highlights of that keynote. <laughs> She's one of the. One of the moments where it felt a little more like authenticity shining through, I think, like a little more of an unscripted vibe that she had. Um, and she kind of told us that it was, you know, the passion for what she's doing shining through. And if that's the case, then that I welcome that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's nice <laughs> to see her. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I'm not going to repeat my blog post on Diginomica that I wrote on an opinionated news review, which I cranked out during a night of sleep deprivation because I couldn't sleep anyway. But uh, I'm not going to repeat it all, but I did get into sustainability on there. And, I, and to me, the more, to your point on ESG, the more they can like integrate those considerations and those compliance issues into the business network, then I think they have a really interesting, distinct message. Whereas when they were walking around last year talking about network of networks, which is one of my least favorite SAP catchphrases, like I struggled a little bit on what, what that actually means to anyone. Why should I care? When you talk about screening for compliance or for even looking into like diversity requirements that may be implicated in this or 
exploitation right. or whatever it is that you're trying to avoid. Now I think the networks start to make a whole lot of sense and and feel very timely. So it's, maybe they're on the right track. I guess. Yeah, I, it, it certainly makes a lot of sense. And obviously, you know, in this age of supply chain disruption, um, it, you know, par excellence or whatever the opposite of that would be, um, this you know this resiliency question is also really big. So now you know if you can populate this network with with a ton of great suppliers, well qualified. And use that as a way for supply chains to be much more resilient, to be able to change change the moment's notice when you know when there's a disruption. Um, that that's a huge value as well because uh, you know I've been talking to a huge number of customers about every you know all those things we know about disruption at the supply chain. It drives into the warehouse. It drives into the customer you know, uh, the customer experience. It drives into the finances. It's everywhere and you know, there's a real hunger for fixing that problem, for getting away from this lean at all costs kind of mentality that put us into this brittle situation with supply chains to begin with. So you and I had a lot of separate meetings, so I, I didn't see you that much, but we did have a few shared things too. And I had to get up very early for a breakfast. Oh yeah. Uh, which is like one of my things when I saw my schedule, I told my excellent schedule person, Samantha, I said, really a breakfast meeting? Cranky just, breakfast meeting. Because yeah. I know I'm going to get in trouble. Not because I'm out late partying anymore, because now, like, the pandemic thing has kind of took the edge off that, but it's more me in my room, like, writing my ass off. Yeah. Anyway, so the alarm goes off, and I haul my ass down there. And before too long, you're actually using the word bullshit. Did I? Do you remember I can't that? Believe it. <laughs> Do you Sorry. remember that? But But I think that rant is worth going into a little bit, because it wasn't so much what you were hearing at all. You weren't, like giving the CX team a hard time, what you were really doing goes back to a blog post, I think, it, that you wrote before the conference. You want to tell well, us well, about okay, that? Okay, so which rant were we talking about? The one well, the, well, the rant really about, well, I think the point around how we need to rethink CX as far as, like, that we when we think about customer experience, it almost becomes a siloed conversation because we're not taking into account supply chain. And one of your points was like, why aren't those people in the room this morning? Yeah. Well, you know, so it, it was interesting because uh, and Samir Patel sort of kicked, kicked me into that lane because he got up and said, you know, a lot of uh, something obvious and it was sort of referring to a second ago that a lot of the problems the customer has with fulfillment, with getting a product is not actually the problem is not in the hands of the, of the customer manager at all. It's it's a supply chain problem. It's a delivery problem. It's a logistics problem. And that's just sort of, you know, that was the red flag. And, you know, I put my horns down and went at it because I've been watching this this problem going on for a number of years, which is fundamentally that you you can't do customer success without talking about how do you get product there? What what happens in the supply chain? What happens in the order management? What happens in all these other domains? And here we are talking about CX with a company that can't compete head to head, feature to feature, you know, uh, uh, charismatic leader to charismatic leader with Salesforce. They got to do something a little more intelligent, but they weren't doing it. They were saying, here's CX. It's a silo. Let's talk about our silo. We're going to have a bunch of analysts. And we're going to be in the silo and we're going to, you know, we're all going to listen to the echo, the loud echo in the silo. And I said, why, why aren't we cross pollinating? We need people who get supply chain. We need people who are, who are there in the, in these other domains because that's really the end to end process we're all talking about. Yeah. To be fair to Ritu, who I met with separately, I think she did comment a bit in that meeting also about how she wants to play to SAP strengths and her in her strategy now that she's <clears throat> taken over. And of course the big strength is the back end and, the whole, and, the whole and thing, being yeah. able to, to, to connect that. And I think it is so true that, that if, you know, I, I think a lot about when customer experiences break down and it's almost always logistics related, right? It's almost always something going on with something that's shipping or a flight that's, uh, Don't sorry to bring that, that up, no, uh, that's being mismanaged, but it's something beyond the realm of just, uh, you know, something you would see in your, your call center record or your service right. record. And uh, the reason this has a lot of import is because there's this whole thing flying around around this customer data platform concept. And, you know, a lot of organizations and vendors are spending a lot of time thinking about how do we consolidate all of our customer data. And the question becomes, 
are you kind of wasting your time a little bit, right? Like, are you building a new data platform that still doesn't incorporate some of the most important elements that you would need to serve your customers? So I think yeah. it's an interesting time to kind of take a reset on that and say, should we do things differently? And SAP is clearly the company that needs to take take on that challenge. So we'll see if 100%. they do. Yeah, I ran into Ritu later, actually, in the day. And, and, you know, she gets it. I think, you know, I told her, look, and this is a problem because she's relatively new. So I said, you know, H HXM, the, the success factor is supposed to have been unfortunately making the same mistake for a while, which is that if you take if you take the fight to the competitor's field where they're the category leader and they've got all the mind share, you're you're just you're just fighting you're on defense all day long. Uh if you if you try to bring it to your field, your rules, <laughs> your refs, your strengths, where they can't compete as well, you, you got a, you got a fighting chance. And I think that's the story of CX. You, you're not going to go up against Salesforce feature functionality, you know, leader to leader. You're going to have to be smarter and a little more strategic. And, and the customers want this. That's the real important thing. They need these end-to-end -end processes to work more than ever. Right. So, and and this kind of ties into a little bit of my meeting with. Julia White, the Chief Marketing Officer at SAP, and if you haven't become familiar with her yet, if you're watching this company, she's someone you need to keep an eye on because she's playing an important role, which is a little different than we've had at SAP for a while. We've had some CMOs that I don't think were really key players in designing and delivering on everything, but I think she is, and and she wants SAP to be known for things more than just SAP ERP, and I think part of the opportunity there for SAP is to be able to say, look, we can help you tackle this whole thing, right? Yep. We can help you tackle this from the customer perspective, from the business network perspective. And of course we have this S4 HANA thing and, and hey, yeah, by the S4 way, we HANA. have Rise too, oh, yeah. as, as opposed to like Rise, 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 which we haven't even talked about today. Uh, do we have to? No, we don't. Okay. I, I well, wrote, we can. I'm, I'm willing to. I did write about that in my blog post, so if you want to look at how I view the impact of Signavio on Rise, which I think is one of the big stories this year with Rise. Check out the post. We don't have to go into all of that in our podcast because Josh is actually on a timetable today. We got to get him to his next thing. Josh, what I, else? I got are you, time for you, brother. Don't worry. What else are you chasing? What are, What other stories did you? Well, I, I mean, that was that was that was obviously a real real big one for me. Um, I think the other two things I'm really interested in, which which dovetail very nicely with the network issue but also with you know the whole future frankly of SAP is really you know I'm 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 like Diogenes walking around you know with a with a lamp looking for the 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 one honest man I'm looking for the gr one great community leader that's going to lead the community of SAP uh, back to greatness because I think that's the real the thing that you really need to do if you're SAP or any vendor in this market right now is okay you got a great Body of product, but you've got to have an amazing community that that drives that that product that 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 really allows for that those moments when the the entrepreneur, the person with the great idea, whether they're outside trying to start a company, whether they're inside trying to do something new that's never been done in their corporation, they wake up two a.m. in the morning, they got a great idea, a light bulb goes off. The second thing they're not doing right now is saying, "And I'm going to build it on SAP. I'm going to build it with SAP tools." They're, they they say. Salesforce, AWS, Azure, I've got all this hyperscaler stuff. SAP has to change that. Um, and they have to, they used to sort of have that a little bit more. You were a mentor, you know, you saw that. Yep. So I was looking for a community. And then the other, my other thing, and you know, is, is similarly the partner network. I think I, I say, no one does partnering well, so let's be honest. Uh, but, but SAP's partnering strategy, in my opinion, could use a lot of, yeah, <laughs> a lot, a lot of stuff. Yeah, it is a little bit of a can of worms, right? Be, um, all the large enterprise vendors struggle with their so-called partner ecosystem. God, I hate that word ecosystem so much. I call it solar system, actually, because in the solar system, the sun destroys everything or warms but everything. Burns everybody. <laughs> depending on. So it's really the solar system to me. But uh, there, are, there are some terrific partner communities in ERP, but they're actually in the mid-market. Uh, I'd point you towards a company like Acumatica, which has a vibrant and engaged partner community that's really, you'd be shocked by the levels of morale and enthusiasm in that world. But, but, but you know, I think what's interesting about SAP, for example, is that they have made it clear 
their partners are really core to what they're trying to do. I mean, I've had numerous conversations about that this week in the context of one of the things I ch- I'm chasing down, which is SAP's neglected public cloud ERP strategy per se, though they're, I think they're going to change that terminology. But the point is the SAP focuses much more on what you might think of as private cloud large enterprise ERP, which is moving people into a hyperscaler thing and then gradually over time cleaning up the core but not eliminating customizations all at once or whatever. But I've been chasing down the public cloud ERP thing. And part of the the roadblocks ahead for SAP there are industry cloud functionality, industry-related stuff. And look, they're not going to be able to rebuild all that themselves, and they know that. And so partners end up factoring very, very heavily into that picture, for example. And partners also obviously factor very heavily into RISE. And so SAP is going to have to get its partner stuff sorted and, you know, you hear some really good partner stories. There's some partners that are really happy. And then I also hear from partners that feel <laughs> kind of different than that. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting. I think uh, to me, what I would say is that SA, that's a high stakes thing for SAP. They're going to have to figure that out if they want to f- yeah. achieve the success that they've laid out. And, and it really means mindset change because, you know, uh, I think pretty much the partner program has existed for one and only one entity historically, and that's SAP. In fact, there's been a lot of things they've done in the partner program, I think, that have been really detrimental to customers. Um, forbidding nice, neat, clean, elegant solutions from being sold to the customer base because they they impinge on the sales strategy of some, some bloated SAP <laughs> product no one actually wants. Um, that's got to shift. That's got to change. It's got to be about customer success. And uh, regardless of whether this this skew on the tables is SAPs or not, the customer needs to succeed. Yep, a story that will go well beyond this this conference, but but it is one to watch. And you know, I think I think community is going to be interesting in the context of these events. And we we did not note this, but we're just at the first of a number of of sapphires. There's a number of them that are going to take place in different. Uh, regions, which I think makes sense, right? There's international travel right now is, is a beast. No one wants to do it. You know, so you're going to have to do regional events, but at the same time, you know, how do you derive a sense of vibrant community on the ground? You know, I, I would say if you're going to be in the U.S., you probably need a more vigorous involvement from your user group, ASUG, getting ASUG members here, getting more customers here. So that's an interesting question for SAP to explore as far as how big do they want this conference to get again? But I think they probably could have done more to put customers on the ground here, though there were some. Uh, so, you know, I think that's an interesting thing for SAP because when you, you know, you can give Salesforce a hard time, you can talk about how their products are getting a little long in the tooth. They're pretty damn good at community, I can tell you that, oh, yeah. by going to their shows. And, you know, the business user community side of SAP, I think, is their biggest community challenge because the developer community, while it is not necessarily quite what it was in terms of, you know, when TechEd was kind of like the enterprise geeks era where there was like this incredible culture around it, it's still there and they're still vocal. And in fact, they had a lot of impact on SAP's BTP developer strategy with their vocalizations for the free tier, which they finally got. So yeah. the developers still advocate, but I think on the business user side, there's still a lot of work to be done. And granted, there's some different user groups that are doing their thing. Obviously, DSEG in, in the German-speaking region is very powerful. But in general, I think SAP community is a little fragmented. So Yeah. And I, th- I think, you know, the thing that you're absolutely right about the business community, I think that's a really hugely important constituency. I, I think one, and this is something I talked to Scott Russell and Julie White about, actually sort of ding them on it a little bit. You know, we need, we we, and I caught myself a member of this community, need North American spokespeople to stand up and be counted. This is, you know, they, this is how, you know, this is how our culture works. The rugged individualist Jeffersonian man, you know, breaking down the, you know, the, the prairie and the, the woods to build that, that, that homestead. We, we, we like those, those cults of personality. We, we, you know, and I, what I said to, to, I've actually said this to several of the board members. If I say, if I say Mark, if I say Sacha, uh, you know who I'm talking about. Mm. Uh, if I say Christian, business user, the business community outside of the deep SAP folks and, and without the SAP context have no idea what I'm talking about. 
you need to have that connection to a person, to an individual, to a, to a, to that kind of North Star in the North American market. And uh, without it, um, you know, I think without it, SAP gets dinged. Actually, literally, the opposite happens. They 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 lose credibility. They don't they, they don't even just drift off into anonymity. They they actually slip as a result. So I think that really needs to change. There's two strong board members now in North America. Scott Russell's in New York. Julia's out on the West Coast, and they need to leverage those people big time. They say they're going to, so watch this space. TikTok, TikTok. Watch, yeah. watch this space. Well, Josh, I think we've, we've covered some good ground. I realize we can't possibly cover everything that our listeners would want us to talk about, but is there anything else you wanted to say? Um, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a silo busting mood these days, so I'm just going to end mm. with that. I think that death to all silos. It sounds death like to a, all silos. Sounds like a blog. sounds like a Josh Greenbaum blog post. It's kind yeah, of funny. but but I saw, you know, I saw a little too much of that here again this week. I think that they've really got to think outside the silo. I think it's a complicated structure for this company. They built, you know, they they have a they have a board of you know of. Uh, 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 sort of a city-state, good old, you know, Hanseatic League city-state model replicated in the board. They've got to sort of transcend that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the customers demand it. And the customers demand broken silos and, and end-to-end processes that don't necessarily traverse the entire SAP product line. They want support even if they're not running SAP. Uh, I think that's really a key thing that SAP has to think about going forward. Yeah, I, I, I said at the end of my post, my first Sapphire post, and I have more coming, but the one on the opinionated news review, that one of the things for me that changed so much is that for many years I was part of SAP's blogger program, which no longer exists. It was an incredibly cutting-edge program in my opinion, but one of the reasons it changed is that the world changed. There's There's very few <laughs> independent bloggers left per se, you were always really more on the analyst side of SAP, even at, during those times. So you were considered right. a friendly, I think. But uh, yeah, but but for me, I kind of lost a lot of my ways in which I connected with SAP. But nevertheless, SAP continued like this year to bring me in and give me the kind of access that I needed. And what I said is, I have a lot of respect for SAP for doing that because what it allows me to do is then share what I've learned, which. This podcast is one attempt to doing that. And, you know, SAP is aware that not everything I'm going to say is particularly flattering, but yep. there are some things that I really do like about where this company is heading as well. And, you know, I give SAP a lot of credit for those transparent conversations because to me, like when it comes down to it, all of us in this world have responsibility not just to make money. <laughs> It's not the key thing for me. It's like, let's have better projects. Let's have better results. Let's, let's do this the right way. And, and we can't do that without these transparent discussions. So I give SAP a lot of credit for allowing that to happen, knowing that it's not always that much fun to listen to. Yeah. And, and, and they do listen. Uh, they don't necessarily act on every great, brilliant suggestion we come up <laughs> with, but, but they're listening. That's, that's a big step. It is. So give them a lot of credit for that. And, and, and I, and I will say too that I think that, the time is right for SAP's sort of more globalist approach to problems. You know, I've, one of the biggest serious problems we face, I think, in, in the world today is this sort of like nationalistic sense of there's all this strife going on in different regions and everything feels like it comes down to a more localized approach to problems and crises. And, you know, SAP speaks to these big themes and I think the time is now to conquer some of these things. And, sustainability has a new resonance right now because of people not being so happy about where oil and gas comes from these days yeah. and what the regions that provide that are doing in the world. And so, you know, SAP has an opportunity without getting too political about it to, to, to have that global sensibility. And I think a lot of vendors are more regional and right. they have a chance, I think, to be a really important voice. And so, for that reason, I'd like to see them succeed. So yeah. let's let's see if they do. Yeah, I think the heart's heart's in it. It's that's always easy to say, and then yeah, harder to measure. But I think it's there. All right, stay tuned. All right, well, folks, we're gonna get out of this abandoned conference room that we commandeer before we get our butts kicked out of here. <laughs> and uh, maybe Josh will have a few more words for the Hilt manager before he leaves. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, they they sent me a little little. Uh, 
a little uh, <laughs> love email, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. friends again, I'm sure. Thanks, Josh. Well, that's Thanks for another for time. Me. Thanks, Josh. I really okay. appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, bye. Okay, John Reed again. And hey, sorry if the volume levels on this are a little bit choppy, but this is a major audio surgery here to try to get you this content. Uh, So this next bit is just a seven minute uh, on the show floor uh, little deal with uh, Jeff Scott, ASUG CEO. Uh, We just quickly uh, grabbed a few moments. We hadn't seen each other in uh, almost three years uh, in person. And so it was kind of a a moment, I guess you could say, but it was an opportunity also to talk about uh, something that I care a lot about, which is the importance of content curation as opposed to uh, just grabbing pieces of content and why curation can hopefully uh, help people achieve better project results. Uh, but also just a chance to talk with Jeff a little bit about the mood on the floor. Uh, it's just a real short ditty, but I thought you might enjoy it. And there will be obviously more in-depth coverage from user groups going forward. This is just a little a uh, quick moment that I thought I would share with y'all. So, John Reed did Dynamica, and I am here at ASUG Accelerate, where also SAP Sapphire is taking place in Orlando. And I'm with Jeff Scott, the CEO of ASUG. What a coincidence that I got the naming right. I mean, it only takes a couple takes, John. <laughs> yeah, we might have to do that one more time. Yeah, there's been a lot, right. a lot of hours spent here already. So, so we only have a couple minutes, so what I want to ask you first is, Give me the pulse of the customers you're talking to on the ground. What are, say, the top two or three things that customers care about right now that they're talking to you about? Uh, First of all, the customer pulse here is great. Uh, They are thrilled to be back together again. They're thrilled to be able to be in an environment where they feel safe and they feel that they can have face-to-face conversations. So we're checking all those boxes uh, for people. What are they talking about? Hey, what do we do in a post-pandemic world? Right? We, We know some realities. We know that... Virtual, virtual work is here to stay, that our, the way we do big projects, the way we do things in the future is going to be different. So how do we do that and how do we think about that? And I think one of the great things about this facility and bringing people back together again face-to-face is they can have those face-to-face discussions, which leads me into the second point. What are they looking for? They're looking for peer-to-peer connections. How do I talk to all the other folks out there who might be experiencing something different? And while we think that peer-to-peer happened during the pandemic, my hunch is it didn't happen nearly as much as we thought because so many organizations were you know, self, uh, self-reflected self and internally reflecting on their internal issues. And you sometimes need events like this, John, in order to get people from different walks of life coming together. You don't just randomly call up you know, some other person at another company on, on Teams call or Zoom and say, hey, let's just do a random walk-by. These are, these are, these are where these happen. Um, and unless that's a really deep relationship, um, it's unlikely to occur. But the amount of hugging we've seen, the amount of this embraces even in a post-covid world where people want to be careful yeah. you know they're still wanting to hug each other yeah i got a mask but we still got you, a hug you, so. you, you, you demanded a hug and you were like no i want to hug it out because i haven't seen you exactly. in three years yeah so the hell with that hell with that i'm gonna exactly. i'm gonna take that risk and we're seeing that all over the, the floor you know yeah. people are just seeing each other their eyes light up and they're like i missed you i didn't know i missed you but i missed you i see you I think that's amazing. Well, for me, the for me the big change is that like if I hear something in a keynote that SAP says about product, then I head down to the show floor and talk to someone at a booth and get the exact information on what's available and what's not. And virtually, that's really tough to do. And so it's you, hard to find people virtually. It is. It is. Um, so okay. So so another thing ASOC's been heavily involved with is the development of content around various areas that SAP customers care about, including S4 HANA. What have you learned lately about the considering S4 HANA from a customer perspective? What do your members need from you in terms of content and advice and guidance? I, I think what we've come away from the pandemic thinking about is the idea of clarity. What customers are asking for us to do is not to be a repeater of all this content that's out there. And you know, kind of like email, there's not a whole lot of cost to putting content out in the marketplace. But there is a big cost in every one's propensity to be able to read it and dedicate time to it. Just like, you know, uh, I'm sure with you as is with me, John, I don't look at my Yahoo mailbox with joy. When I open it up, I know there's, you know, 99% of what's in there I don't want.
want to talk about or I'm not interested in. And weeding through and finding that one percent is time consuming, and it, it takes away from your your ability to really focus on that one percent. So what we're trying to do from NASEC point of view is really speak with the customers, partners, and SAP and analysts to determine what is the best of the best and curating that together so customers have a much better way of navigating. So in my view, in a post-pandemic world, our job is to be better content curators, not better content producers. You know, producing at volume doesn't get it done. Producing quality content that helps customers solve and answer questions is really where we need to be. Well, and when I think about things like evaluating S4, I think about evaluating rise in hyperscalers. I think about making a business case. If I, if I just watched a random series of webinars, that wouldn't really help me that much with that. But if I could take like more of a structured approach to it, like you said, and you could guide me through, okay, here's the next question that you need to be thinking about. Right. And, and especially if you can then add the member intelligence in there to say, here's what other members did at this point in the, in the process. You know? and, and even to take that notion and plus one you on it, we as ASUG, I think in a, in a, in a world where we're no longer doing, you know, where we weren't doing face-to-face -face events, found the time to zoom out and say, wait a minute, hold on. If a customer is going to navigate an S4 adoption journey from beginning to end, what do they need to know? When do they need to know it? And how do we lay that out in a in a model that makes sense? And we've used people like you uh, to validate that. Other analysts, SAP. So we've gone out and said, we think this is what the rough schematic looks like. Help us fill in the gaps. And you know, if you look at where we were pre pre pandemic, we were just doing events all the time. And so it wasn't about hey, how does all this stuff fit together? We were just throwing it out there, right? And and again, relying on the customer customer base to sort through what made sense and what didn't. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to say, help us sort this for you. And I think we owe you, uh, you know, we owe you and our obligation is to help sort it on your behalf. Because I don't think there's time out there for everyone to go through all this. And that's the other thing that the pandemic, I think, has demonstrated to me, is that time is precious and people need to be able to spend the time where they want to, not just churning through lots of useless information. Well, the power of curation as a, as a hobbyist curator. I, I love hearing it. I, I agree with it. And, and if, in case anyone listening to this later, we're dancing around some NDA topics here because they're, ASEC's working on some stuff that we can't formally talk about yet. But well, we're starting to push it out slowly, yeah. right? We're being careful about it. We're calling it Member Pathways. We talked yeah. about it in today's keynote. I think it's going to be really a, a game changer and differential for the community. And it's really, I think, us being good stewards of the community and saying, hey, our job is to help you sort through. You know, we have to be able to do three things. We need to be able to help people learn, help them connect each to each other, and help them grow their careers. And I think if we do those three things really, really well, we're in absolute service to this community. So the, the member pathways for S4 is now? We are just starting to roll it out now. We are going to do four different pathways this year. So S4 is the first. BTP will follow. Uh, and we have two others on the slate. Okay. All right, Jeff. Thanks a lot. We're out of time, man. Thanks, John. Good to see you. Later.